While the MCU films may be about superheroes, there are still lowly, fallible humans writing the scripts, running the cameras, and working behind the scenes to make it all happen. Here's an affectionate look at some of the biggest movie mistakes that have weaseled their way into the MCU so far. Black Widow is as impressive a spy and assassin as ever walked the planet, and she's demonstrated those talents on more than one occasion. However, none of them were quite as impressive as when she made her entrance early on in the first Avengers movie. When Black Widow arrives on the screen, she's tied to a chair surrounded by a bunch of baddies who, by their own calculations, are in total control of the situation. Except, of course, they're not. I'm in the middle of an interrogation. This moron is giving me everything. I don't give everything. Everyone got a kick out of the ensuing encounter, with Black Widow calmly flipping around, beating the crap out of the astonished bullies literally with two hands tied behind her back. The only problem? At one point in the struggle, she literally beats back one of the bullies with her hair. In a move that looks like it was probably supposed to be a headbutt to the face, Black Widow's supercharged locks gently brushed her opponent's face, only to send him reeling backward. While this could have been a hint at some odd new superpowers to come, chances are it was just a poorly filmed stunt that slipped into the final cut. Guardians of the Galaxy was a sweet ride, and a nice way for Marvel to expand the MCU into a more galactic mindset. It also was loaded with laughs, many of which trace their way back to Peter Quill's Earth origins. Right in the opening scenes, we see Star-Lord using a cassette player to boogie down with Awesome Mix Volume 1 blasting in his ears. There's no denying that, right along with the Avengers themselves, that mix is among the best things Marvel ever assembled, with the compilation going on to become the second soundtrack ever to sell over a million digital albums. But while everyone was busy toe-tapping to the music and laughing at the comical adventures of Quill and company, a quiet little detail slipped right past our nostalgic eyes. Star-Lord's cassette is a TDK Type 2 CDing 2 tape, a model that didn't come out until 1993. That doesn't make sense. Quill was abducted from Earth by Yondu in 1988, so unless the Ravagers chose to circle back around a few years later to let Quill copy his favorite soundtrack onto a new tape, chances are this mixtape was a genuine mix-up. Of course, regardless of the year it was made, a cassette tape that has been played for 20 years probably wouldn't be delivering the crisp digital quality we heard in the movie anyway. But that's a discussion for another day. Spider-Man had long been a missed character in the MCU, until he finally arrived on the scene when he briefly participated in Captain America Civil War. Alright, I ran out of patience. Under ruse! Since then, the Crime Stopper from Queens has earned his own solo movies and played an important part in Infinity War. It was the first part of Spider-Man Homecoming, though, in which the folks at Marvel had one of their most obvious face plants to date. It all had to do with a little time jump that left fans scratching their heads in bewilderment. In general, the MCU tends to follow a real-life timeline that occurs at or near the time each movie is released. However, in Homecoming, the movie begins with a flashback to the aftermath of the Battle of New York, which is supposed to take place in 2012. It then claims to jump forward eight years, which would put the rest of the movie in 2020. This throws it off from the rest of the MCU timeline, especially considering the fact that it would put Spidey's first film right smack dab in the middle of the five-year snap gap. While the Webhead sequel does get back on track by lining up with the events of the blip, the year for the first film is definitely off-kilter and has even been confirmed by Joe Russo to be a mistake. Oh, the time, it was eight years, I believe. Uh, it yes. was quite controversial. Yes. 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 Very inc incorrect. <laughs> eight years. Sometimes it's the little details that matter. Things like continuity between scenes, details on a costume, or filling in background content with meaningful information can often take a decent flick to the next level. Over the years, the MCU has done a fantastic job in this regard, maintaining both continuity and impressive details throughout the complex web of storylines that they've woven. But even the geniuses at Marvel aren't flawless, as was made apparent in a quick little scene from Iron Man 2. Toward the beginning of the film, Tony watches a clip of himself on C-SPAN's YouTube channel. The clip is titled Stark Industries CEO Tony Stark on Capitol Hill. The only problem? The Capitol Hill he's on should be spelled C-A-P-I-T-O-L, but the video spells it A-L. It may be common to hire editors for the script, but it looks like Marvel may need to get somebody on board to check on-screen spelling as well. Everyone knows Gamora is awesome, and she has one of the absolute best backstories in the MCU to boot. How many protagonists can claim to be part of the Thanos family and still be one of the good guys? As compelling as Gamora's origin is, though, she's been around long enough now for a bit of a wrinkle to develop in her narrative. The issue occurred as a result of the writer's attempts to weave her relationship as Thanos' adopted daughter in with her otherwise busy storyline with the Guardians of the Galaxy. The main issue here concerns her original people. 
The scene in Guardians of the Galaxy in which the gang is arrested by Nova Corps is full of a boatload of background info as well as some typically edgy humor, largely thanks to Star-Lord. During the scene, a small detail flashes up on the screen for a moment regarding Gamora's origin. It states that she's the last survivor of the Zehuberi people. Of course, anyone who's watched Infinity War will recall that we see Gamora being taken in by the Mad Titan who distracts her as half of her people are annihilated. Half, though? What happened to the rest that would make Gamora the last survivor? While explanations could doubtlessly be cooked up, chances are this one is just an oversight. It's easy to excuse incorrect small details as oversights, but a ton of the Marvel magic takes place in those very details. It's an art that the MCU has mastered with cleverly hidden clues and Easter eggs building up so much anticipation for the arrival of new characters and stories over the years. But even the masters can stumble from time to time. Such is the case with a brief bit of text that flashes up on the screen during Captain America The Winter Soldier. As the camera pans across the Triskelion Shield headquarters, it flashes a quick latitude and longitude graphic on the screen, showing where exactly this impressive building is located. It's the kind of detail that most viewers would ignore, while diehard fans will take screenshots of it in order to go look it up later. Unfortunately, in this case, the diehards won't ever get to know precisely where Shield HQ is located, since the on-screen directions both read as latitude, with one indicating north and the other south. Worst reading ever. In the scene in Captain America the Winter Soldier, when Steve Rogers visits the Smithsonian exhibit about his own life, he approaches a memorial to Bucky Barnes. The scene is overloaded with information, so it's hard to take it all in, but at the bottom of the entry it reads, Bucky Barnes, 1917 to 1944. Set against this, however, is the first line at the top of the memorial, which reads, Born in 1916. Okay, so which was it, guys? The best part about this one is that the typo takes place on the same piece of information. Usually, there are a few movies separating bits of contradicting information within the MCU, which seems like a reasonable excuse for when a developing storyline goes awry. This time, though, it appears that someone simply changed their mind about Bucky's birth year in the short span of time it took to write two paragraphs of text, and then never went back to fix the original date. Doctor Strange ends up being a pretty cool guy by the end of his first film, and his appearances in Thor Ragnarok and Avengers Infinity War only add to his aura and appeal. But of course, the Sorcerer Supreme started as a cocky, career-obsessed doctor that acted like he owned the world. The early sequences of the movie portray the future master of the mystic arts as a surgeon at the very top of his game, strutting around the operating room like he owns the place. But is he really a master of his craft? Some have called Strange's surgical skills into question when they notice that right in the opening moments of his solo film, Doctor Strange washes his hands and then puts on his mask. This isn't taking place in the 18th century, but in modern times, when it should be common practice for a surgeon to not touch anything that could break the sterile field after scrubbing, including his own face. The info should be common knowledge, especially to the best surgeon in town. And yet, this accomplished professional takes his sterile hands and touches his face right before surgery. It's a rookie mistake that's hardly the sign of a master of any art form. We've already established the excellence of the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, but as we saw with Quill's cassette deck, even films as good as these aren't impervious to errors. In Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. 2, though, the error is a bit more obvious. The second installment of the franchise opens with a little backstory on the relationship of Peter Quill's parents, with the movie showing Ego and Meredith Quill cavorting through the Missouri countryside. As Ego leads Meredith down a slope to show him the alien seedling he's planted, she can be seen fleeting down the slope behind him in fur-capped boots. However, a moment later, she's shown next to the strange glowing plant in sandals. Was the script continuity supervisor homesick that day? After all, going from winter to summer footwear is a pretty noticeable difference. While the change is subtle on screen, it's a mistake that the MCU, with all of its attention to tiny details, can't expect to go unnoticed. Something is amiss at the end of the Avengers, in one of the final scenes of the movie. As the team splits up, we see each Avenger as they go their separate ways, heading off to the next great adventure. One of the scenes shows Steve Rogers dressed down from his Captain America uniform, riding a motorcycle as he ponders all that's taken place. The scene is serene, tranquil, and calm. A bit too calm, actually. After a moment, it becomes glaringly apparent that there's no way Cap is actually riding a real bike that's moving down the road. Many fans point to the fact that his hair doesn't even budge during the scene, as proof that Chris Evans is just sitting still. The truth is, though, if you look closely, the hair actually does move toward the end of the clip, a little flip caused by a light draft. However, when taken into consideration, this only reinforces the fact that if he was actually driving at 50 miles an hour, his hair would be flapping all over the place. Once you notice Steve's strangely motionless hair, it takes a moment of cathartic closure and it turns into a scene that screams green screen. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about the Marvel Cinematic Universe are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.